Josh, I'm starting to allow some of the presenters to join as panelists. Okay, perfect. We are uh, currently being recorded as FYI. Good, yeah, thank you. In like a couple more minutes, or do you think we're good to go? No, let's do a couple more minutes. I think we need more of our COD members. Good afternoon, John. Hi, hey, Tom. How are you? Good. How about yourself? Doing well, thank you. All right, John, how do we feel? I think we need to give it one, one more minute here. Um, we should have at least two more CID members joining us. John, do you mind promoting Jeff Hallenbeck on my team to a panelist too? I did try to. Uh, and then uh, Jim Montemayor as well, right? You'll have to accept. Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> So if there's anyone else from the, the first team that needs to speak, go ahead and raise your hand and we'll get you promoted to a panelist. Give it one more minute here, Josh.
Okay, Josh, I think we're all set. All right. Uh, so good afternoon. I'm Josh Sun, along with John Law, and we're with the Department of Planning and Development. Welcome to the December 14th, 2022 meeting of the Committee on Design. Please be advised that this meeting is being recorded and live streamed to DPD's YouTube page. To our esteemed committee, thank you for volunteering your time to be a part of this advisory group. To the members of the public who are joining us, what you will see today and at future Committee on Design meetings are projects currently under review by DPD staff. The committee is a voluntary advisory body of design professionals that provide their expertise on design issues. This committee is not a substitute for plan commission as it is not a forum for public debate, nor is the advice of the committee legally binding. It is the hope that today's discourse will lead to recommendations that will elevate the design excellence of the city of Chicago. These recommendations will be forwarded to DPD staff for consideration as they review these projects for plan commission and subsequent approvals. Before we get to the agenda, to members of the public, you are welcome to begin submitting comments and questions through the Q&A box. Committee members are invited to review this information during and after each presentation and incorporate the comments into the discussion. We will not be reviewing questions or comments from the public individually, but we'll be recording them for use when reviewing the project. We will now move on to the first item on the agenda. <clears throat> it's 420 North May, so uh, if the applicant team wants to go ahead and start sharing their screen, uh, please do so. So 420 North May Street, located in the 27th Ward, is a proposed 600-foot-tall, 52-story residential building comprising 587 residential units, 339 automobile parking spaces, and 205 bicycle parking spaces. The proposal will provide 21,000 square feet of public open space, along with amenity space and terraces, located on several floors above the podium. The podium will preserve components of an existing building that will be painted and stained along with new glass and metal storefronts. The ground floor will consist of new masonry with most of the structure skinned with the faceted window wall system, glass slab edge covers, and metal panels. To any committee members who are associated with, with this project, if you have not yet, please recuse yourself at this time and for the duration of the review for this project. To the presenters, please clearly state your name and your relation to the project prior to speaking. You have about 15 minutes to present your proposal. Uh, again, committee members, please hold your comments and questions until after each presentation. Please proceed with the presentation and state your name prior to speaking. Thank you. Great, thank, thank you. you. Um, sorry, go ahead, Maria. That's okay, thank you. My name is Mariah Degrino with the law firm of DLA Piper. We're representing Crescent Heights, uh, which is the proposed developer today. I'm joined by members of the Crescent Heights team as well as um, the project architect, uh, HPA, led by Tom Pope. Um, the project, uh, as Josh mentioned, is seeking approval of a planned development. Um, it's currently zoned M1-2, but it is in the downtown area. So we'll first be rezoned to the DX5 district and then a planned development established for the project. At this point, I'll turn it over to Tom Pope from HPA to talk about the design, the development and the plans. Thank you. Great, thank you, Mariah. Again, my name is Tom Pope. I'm a partner with HPA and uh, thank you all for your time this afternoon. Um, uh, just a high level summary of the metrics that were mentioned. Um, we're proposing today a 52 story new construction residential tower with 587 residential units, mixtures of micros, ones, twos, and three bedroom units, uh, 339 parking spaces, and all in uh, a total of 600,000 square foot of FAR applicable area. And that'll be done through um, the underlying zoning base of DX5 plus a 3.1 bonus. Um, HP has a unique perspective as we've held an office in the market for the past 25 years. And so I've seen this neighborhood evolve um, from primarily a meatpacking to a diverse, vibrant neighborhood that it is now. And so we're, we're really excited to be a part of such an important development as May Street. Um, being located at the north end of Fulton Market, it really acts as a bookend to what is currently a procession of high density mixed use development much of which, which has been approved or under construction, and some of which is currently in review by DPD and with you folks, of course. Um, because we understand the site is important and highly visible, our intent is to bring something that is architecturally evocative, iconic, and timeless. And at the same time, we think it's important to connect with and respect uh, with the existing context and history of the site. 
just get you situated here, the site is located in that purple box that I'm showing here. And it's bound by uh, Racine, Kinsey, and uh, May Street. And we are um, outside the historic district, but we are in the innovative district. And we are within uh, two uh, radius of two transportation hubs and one potential future Metro line hub, all of which is we're kind of factoring in for our total parking count and as we uh, shape the building. The primary, the adjacent site around us is primarily existing and vacant lots for the exception of on the lower right hand side there, you can see that's the existing Trammell Crow commercial building. Looking onward to the site, our site is primarily a vacant uh, lot with an existing uh, roughly 30,000 square foot building of which we intend to keep a portion of that and then I'll walk you through. This slide is showing um, a little bit of the uh, existing uh, massing context and, and something that we're really interested in is just looking at the procession of what development is, is coming towards Hubbard Street. You could see there's an increasing um, change in density. Uh, you could see that with our, our buildings proposed right here, how that particular massing fits in with the context. And we understand we are uh, one of the taller buildings in the district currently planned. Uh, but you could see by some of the adjacent developments that um, there are significantly tall developments that are on the boards. Here's another view looking northwest of the massing, our project in particular, with some of the other adjacent proposed or upcoming developments. As I mentioned, our plan was to keep the existing building to some extent. Uh, right now, it's, it's not in the best shape. Our plan is to revitalize it. It's a little bit of a patchwork, a clean up the facade and integrate it in a nice way um, with the new construction portions of our building. Just a little bit about our design inspiration for the project. As we started on the vision, um, we wanted to take some contextual cues to help us inform the design. And so we started by looking at the history of the site and we discovered, um, interesting enough, that what was originally Racine was actually called Ann Street and it did make a, uh, a, a physical connection through our site. And so we thought this would be an interesting way to incorporate it and help inform some of the access and geometry of the building. Given the site also has an existing structure, we wanted to find ways to inform the base of our tower using visual datums, materiality, and help organize the program lower in the building. And the site is also located between the Union Pacific and North Central train lines which creates this visual, visual connection to downtown and gives you a sense of momentum. Um, we like this idea um, because it, it kind of promotes this idea of perhaps faceting and articulating the facade in a way that gives the, the building visual interest, depth, and dynamism. And then along Racine uh, Street here, you'll notice a little triangular shaped greenery a lot. Um, we thought this was a good cue for us to help anchor the tower of our building. Some history on the massing studies. This slide uh, portrays some of the original massing that we had presented um, originally to DPD. And after getting some uh, positive feedback and suggestions, we were asked to present uh, to you folks today. And uh, the, the goal of today's presentation is to focus on this preferred scheme here on the far right. Some of DPD's original guidance was to include it to explore uh, the role of the green space as it relates to the entry. Uh, look at adding a reveal in between the massing and also look at um, a articulating the crown of the building. And so this is just showing you a little bit of the evolution of how we, we've shaped the articulation of the building. So diving into the site plan, um, right off the bat, we knew that it was going to be important to anchor the building in a good way. On the right here along May and Kinsey is this hatch zone is the existing building of which we're going to keep about 10,000 square feet. So using this as a little bit of an anchor to one side of the site, we made sure to center our tower uh, approximately 50 foot to the north and 90 feet to the east here, and another 100 foot to the south as a way to really respect as many of the adjacent buildings as we could. This also allows us to have a nice uh, landing point for our tower and a, a fairly vast green space that's on the corner here of Racine and Kinsey. To give you an idea on scale, this is about 12,000 square feet which is about 20% of the leftover site area outside of the existing building. Uh, we, we know that it's important to keep all the access 
off of the main street. So we have a drive through lane here that goes through the building for parking, drop off and loading and trash, and et cetera. And here is that a nod to Historic Ann Street, which is a, which is a outdoor um, covered entry pavilion that leads you to the entry to our building. Hi, I just want to note that we are about halfway through your presentation. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna pass through these plans fairly quickly so that I can get to some of the renderings and forms. And if you guys have any questions, we can jump back to this, but. Really our focus here is to activate the street frontage as much as possible, screen all of the parking. And you could see as the plan moves up uh, slowly, we make every attempt to screen the parking and create a gentle taper as you walk up the building. So there's the fourth floor, you could see kind of more of the same, the tower, is, the point tower is situated here as you move up the building and you get to the sixth floor we have an amenity space with a, a large open to sky green space and an amenity deck that looks down below the parklet. The building uh, continues to taper up uh, as you walk up the building, getting smaller and smaller. And each time it steps, we create a little bit more outdoor or amenity space. In terms of materiality, uh, we wanna use warm, um, you know, natural materials down low in the building to respect the context of Fulton Market. And so we're just showing a, a mixture of warm tone bricks, dark bronzes, some um, weathered woods. And uh, we're interested in a kind of high refined um, level of detail for the tower itself. So looking at the elevations here, you can see how some of the massing moves come together in the articulation of the facade. This is that um, kind of spine reveal that helps organize the massing between the point tower and the stepping facade. Uh, here you can see I have a little bit of the brick uh, components that tie in with the adjacent building. Uh, more of the same on the other two elevations. Uh, this red line here indicates where the viaduct is, and you can see that uh, blocks a good portion of our northern um, facade. So I'm going to skip ahead to the renderings here. Um, overall shot looking northeast, you can see how everything comes together. You know, we're interested in, again, Articulating the base in a, in a good way, um, highly highly refined and detailed, but also playing off of this modernist tower um, with you know refined detailing, articulation at the corners in the way of balconies, and the faceting of, of the facade. This is a view of the main residential entry, showing kind of where these two elements converge with the entry to the building, uh, outdoor space amenity that looks down onto the parklet, and transition of the tower above. At the stepping area, we're showing um, some dark bronze uh, tracing along the slab edges to help integrate it with the base. So this is a view around the vehicular drop off here. You can see how some of these elements come together, uh, leaving a, a, a large expansive open lobby open to the parklet with a, another um, move up here, which ties in with the amenity and the datum of the existing building. This is the corner showing the existing building and the new construction, a slight recess between the two to, to mark the old versus the new, and then the tower in the background. And we are intending and keeping the existing water tower as well. You have about five minutes left. Thank you. Uh, this view here is showing how the tower is kind of gently tapering towards the top, um, leaving the amenity deck wide open and creating a little bit of, of relief to our neighbor to the east. And then uh, backing up, looking at the shot at night, um, we're interested in how this building looks in the evening, how it's lit. You know, we want some vibrancy here. We're looking at the translucency of the crown, and um, you know, we're 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 liking how this is coming together and how it's starting to fit well with uh, some of the context. I'm going to pass through these really quick. These are blow up details of some of the uh, areas that I've covered already. and skip to um, kind of a cross section of the building, just touching on some of the program, a lobby residential amenity. You can see by the bulk of the building, we have residential units in the midsection of the building, uh, more amenity towards the top at the last break, uh, larger scale residential units, and then the crown, which helps conceal the elevator penthouse and uh, mechanical uh, penthouse. Uh, we are looking, actively pursuing uh, tracking the 100 points for sustainable design. 
uh, through a number of ways. I have my head of sustainability available should we want to dive into any detail here. And we have looked at a shadow study uh, for various times of the day and uh, a year, and which is part of the reason why we wanted to make sure we taper the tower in a sensible way, trying to make it as skinny as possible as you um, rise to the top. And with that, um, that wraps up our presentation. Happy to field any questions. All right, thank you so much. Uh, committee members, if there are any comments from the public in the Q&A box, please incorporate them however you see fit. Otherwise, the floor is now yours for comments and questions to the applicant team. Please raise your Zoom hand and we will call on you. Yes, Casey. Um, yeah, I'm, uh, I'll get the group started. I um, first of all, I just want to compliment you all on um, getting a number of things right in this submission. It really feels like the the desire to create a skinny tower and to articulate it in pieces so that um, you end up with this sort of thin, elegant um, element uh, is. Uh, seems like the right sensibility for the site. Um, but one of the questions I have it really gets to the kind of overall material composition of the scheme, um, which is that in a couple of places, it seems like the base is somewhat awkward relative to the tower. Um, and it it's also, to my mind, a little um, odd that you have uh, two so seemingly similar um, towers, both clad in glass, side by side. Um, and so I would have expected to have seen, you know, a broader material palette, say, on the stepped facade um, to kind of heighten um, everything that you're trying to do to draw attention to the modernist tower. Yeah, that's um, that sounds like more like a, not so much a question, but um, just a, a recommendation, um, but let me kind of flip to that really quick here. You know, when we first looked at this, we were contemplating that, you know, do we go with something that is a little bit more opaque on the stepped facade? And, you know, after, you know, really looking at it, looking at the massing and, and you know, some of the articulation around it, we went with the glass because we felt that with a tall tower, such as this, it would uh, translate a little bit better to keep a consistency and materiality um, in a, a very tall building. Um, we wanted to stay away from too much opacity, you know, in the building to to um, make it feel overly heavy. And but it's definitely something that we looked at. That's part of the reason why we're showing a little bit more heavy hand on the horizontal slab edges is really to add a little bit of that detail that makes it different than the modernist tower. Eleanor? Uh, thank you for the presentation. You know, I really um, appreciate the work that your team has done to integrate this new construction project in with the historic facades um, on the site. I was asking if that was a request of the community or not, and I understand this is this is part of the design concept that you have. Um, I think it's especially effective given what is across the street to the east and kind of the datum line that was established there. You know, you're echoing that and bringing down the scale. Um, so again, I appreciate that. However. And looking at the plans, I saw that um, this is essentially back of house space. And you know, you do have a challenging site because it is exposed on all sides, essentially. And I was wondering the reason for um, enlarging the openings on the first floor. Thank you, whoever is changing the, the slides, um, because the this side of the building is really concealing back of house stuff such as the bike amenity space, a mechanical space, 
And from my days looking at these plans, um, the gallery space is just a way to build out um, and take advantage of large windows, right? I mean, it doesn't really serve a purpose. It's really too small to get anyone in there to actually be using the space. So I would suggest keeping the historic fenestration that's there in those openings. Perhaps you actually change, you know, the actual windows, how they operate, those can be glass, those can be modern, but I don't see a reason to enlarge that first floor just to then conceal a bike amenity space and mechanical room. So I just wanted to make that quick comment. And then further, you know, the brickwork is actually very beautiful on these buildings. And, um, you know, there's a really nice built out cornice out of brick on these buildings. And I would encourage you to look at maybe cleaning the brick and repairing it, um, because I think it will add a lot of richness to this side of the building that will complement kind of the richness of the new construction to the other side of the wood facade, rather than staining it to blend in. Um, and then it may even make your new construction, your new brick pop even more. So just a few things to consider. Thanks. Yeah, no, I appreciate I appreciate those comments. Yeah, we did look at um, the original color, you know, the bright orange kind of against some of the rest of the building. Um, yeah, you know, it's it's one of those things. We've done a lot of historic uh, renovations, you know, over the years. And when the building is typically when it is the historic element, you're doing something new next to it. You want to make sure that there's a distinction. We felt that in this case, because there's there was a significant amount of uh, damage in, in areas of the building and, and things that were just um, kind of torn, cut up to a point where we thought that staining the brick consistently would be the easiest way to make it look a little bit more cohesive. Um, the ground floor actually is, a like you mentioned, it's a lot of smaller openings and actually the ground floor isn't even level with grade. We believe it's a little bit up, about half a level. So what we did with uh, this elevation on the screen here is uh, pretty much all of it that we're showing um, between this edge here and here is existing. The lower chunks of the building, um, especially on this side was more of a metal shack. And so we didn't see the, a reason to retain that section, um, but the storefront areas in here, we would retain the pilasters and we would restore the stone work uh, and, but we, our intent is to infill it with something that would make this somewhat functional um, because it is one thing to keep the structure, but it's another we would like it to be, you'd be able to pass through it. You know, um, currently as it's designed, the windows, the, the openings are so small, it doesn't really make it that functional. So those are just some thoughts behind how we are approaching this. Will the function stay the same as in the drawings, a mechanical room and a bike storage area? You know, but that, that program is in flux, quite honestly. The gallery that we had back there, that was a little bit of a nod towards, you know, that we understand that there's a there's a program out there right now that, of uh, artists who are going to redo the, the um, mural on Hubbard. And so we thought, what a great way to try to tie in with that program somehow uh, by giving them a space. But, you know, it's we're not exactly sure what we're going to do with that yet. And these are very conceptual plans, you know, the mechanical space is kind of in flux right now. So we could definitely look at creating a little bit more active space um, of, of all of the facades, the total linear footage on the facades, we're activating probably about 95% of it. So we could take another stab at, you know, this cord and see if there's a way to reconfigure the mechanical. The, well, no, no, they, my comment actually is going in the opposite direction. I think it's going to be very difficult for you to activate all elevations. You have a lot of linear footage here. And I would say take, you know, the solid facade that you have as kind of a gift and you don't need to do anything. You don't need to activate it. Mm. It's a historic yeah. facade. Just, just take it and then activate all your new stuff beautifully. So, yeah. and I'll just leave it there, but thank you for the explanation. Sure, no, thank you. Thanks. Leslie, would you wanna go next? Sure. Um, thank you for the presentation and, you know, particularly uh, the care that you've taken to consider the historic elements of the existing building. Um, I think that 
you know, with the rest of the new architecture that you're planning that trying to find, you know, harmony and balance between the new tower and the existing lower scale building is a challenge. Um, first, I'd like to echo Eleanor's comments about maintaining the um, historic character and integrity of the existing building um, and really being judicious about where you're going to and how you're going to um, bring forward the historic character of the existing building. One of my, um, in addition to, you know, looking at the fenestration and really, you know, creating hierarchy with the facades um, is also the location of the existing water tower. I noticed that the water tower has been relocated um, from the northeast corner to, to a little bit closer to the Kinsey Street edge and on a newly constructed portion of the building. And um, while uh, I think it's whimsical and um, you know, nostalgic and fun to have a water tower as a part of this building, um, as it adds to the architecture and vision that you have for the building, I, I, I don't think that it is helping maintain um, that vision. Uh, if it were, for example, closer to the corner or there was a strong corner element on Kinsey and May that the water tower then punctuated, I could understand the effort that you would take to you know, relocate the water tower. However, the location that it's in really is um, solely to kind of advertise for the building and not necessarily add to um, any kind of function or uh, you know, help, for example, elevate that secondary residential entrance in, in any significant way. So I, I would encourage you just to, because I know this is adding costs and I know it's probably adding, you know, a little bit of heartache to try to fit this thing in. Um, and I, I have a feeling that you, one of the reasons why it may have been relocated is because it's blocking views from some of the residential units. But I, I, I don't believe that it's necessary or helpful in the architecture of the building if you should decide at some point um, that it's no longer needed or warranted. Um, my second comment is really about the, the top of the building, the crown of the building. Um, I know that there you know, is some effort to create uh, to have a building top, you know, to know where this tower ends and to really kind of terminate the building in, in a feature. Um, I'd like you to think about, you know, the proportions of this crown in comparison to, you know, the intentional effort that you've made with um, the relief on that tower facade. I think that um, it's, there's, there's something about the proportion of that crown that is in disharmony with both the tower and the other areas of the building where it steps down. And that the, the, the termination of, this, of the top of that tower could be done a little bit more gracefully. Um, there may be a mechanical mezzanine and other programmatic functions that are kind of you know, leading you to creating this tall element. But um, I, I would recommend taking another look at it and also its architectural expression and materiality to make sure that it's consistent with the vocabulary that you have throughout the rest of the building. And lastly, um, looking at the relationship between the tower elements and the elements that step down, I understand this datum that you've created with extension of the floor plate um, and the material and color change. Um, it, with the care and intention that you've, you know, that you've shared with us around the angles and the relief on the tower, I'm not seeing the same care in those the, the uh, elements of the building that step down. And I'd like to see sort of one more layer of uh, mm -hmm. to create a closer relationship between the tower and the parts of the building that step down. And that could be done with similarly kind of turning some of the glass. It could be done with you know, a hierarchy of larger scale and smaller scale images, but creating sort of a closer relationship that's more in balance and harmony between the two sides of the building, I think would strengthen the party as a whole. Um, and lastly, looking at the base of the new construction piece of this building, um, because there's been a lot of care given to thinking about, 
using this existing brick building, it would be great to pull some of those masonry features into the base of the new construction part of the building um, so that there is a, a stronger relationship. And that brick doesn't even have to be the same color. I mean, right now, um, you're proposing staining the existing building, um, but should you think about a lighter touch on those historic elements, bringing that into the base of the new construction building just to show that there is a relationship and that this existing building is not a leftover piece, but it's actually um, has architectural integrity that you wanted to bring in the, into the new construction piece, I think would also strengthen the base of that building um, and enhance the public realm and pedestrian experience uh, in terms of orientation and wayfinding. Great. Yeah, thank you for those comments. Michael, I think you're our last one. Uh, hi, thank you. Um, I just want to um, express my agreement with the comments that have been made so far. Uh, as many of you know, I have great trouble with this DX zoning throughout the city, and I I just have a comment that relates more to the city than the design team that I, I just think that a 52 story building in the Fulton Market District with minimal public transit just seems off to me, but that's a comment uh, for the city. Related to this particular project, I, I agree. I think that it's uh, in many ways well handled. Uh, I, Tom, I, you offered to have your sustainability person speak. I think we need to hear more uh, from you about the energy efficiency strategies for an all glass 52 story tower with a strong facade to the west. Uh, can you talk to us a little bit about your energy strategy? Jillian, are you on the line? I am. Hi, hi Philip. Thank you for the question. My name is Jillian Agdern. Principal at HPA. Um, yes, the mechanical system is certainly something that we're considering, as well as overall um, improved energy efficiency. That's something that um, is very important to us and how we are uh, looking to achieve the sustainability goals on the project. Um, we'd be looking to use um, a very efficient system for the residential units, um, either a VRF or a um, you know all water source heat pump system um, that would. Uh, perform at a very high level um, in an efficient way for a building of this size and scale. Um, there's certain economies to those systems for a building of this size. Um, we'd also look at very high performance glass, um, low U values, uh, solar heat gain coefficients to make sure that the uh, materiality that we are using is uh, in lockstep with our sustainability goals. Is there, can you maybe tell us a little bit more about maybe what's innovative uh, that helps you achieve a higher level of energy efficiency or anything you're interested in pursuing? Um, yeah, there are many things that we're interested in pursuing on the project. And we're also looking at this as, um, as a wholesale approach. So um, with regard to the um, to the building itself, in addition to the um, into the glass and using spandrel strategically um, throughout the design to help uh, improve that uh, window wall ratio. Um, we are incorporating the, the green roofs, um, robust insulation at our um, roofing and our solid components uh, using the uh, adaptive and native landscaping to enhance the um, the site response to the building. Um, and we're also considering uh, stormwater and how we can reduce our, imp um, our impact in that way, um, using about 20% of the site area, as Tom mentioned, um, toward the parklet is gonna help us achieve those goals um, across the board. And we know that stormwater is of uh, utmost importance in Chicago. So um, looking at all these things uh, holistically is how we are crafting our approach to sustainability. And right, Phil, just to, yeah. And so we'll have we'll obviously we're we're at the beginning of this. We we are we do a lot of sustainable buildings in town and across the country, and um, we have every intention to dive into this with you know more detail. And we're happy to fill you in as things evolve. But we've 
we've done no shortage of lead um, certified buildings, uh, well buildings. You know, we've done some of the largest um, gold rated buildings in Chicago. And so we're very familiar with strategies here. And uh, we will, it is one of our, you know, one of our critical things that we like to do as architects with these, especially with these types of projects that have a lot of glazing. But as Jillian mentioned, there will be an amount of spandrel glass too, because we know we need to comply with the energy codes and we're well aware of how to uh, deal with that. Tommy. I was just gonna say, I think that sounds great. Because it's a landmark project in Chicago uh, with this exceptional height, I, I just think it would be terrific if it was also very innovative in terms of its energy strategies. So I just encourage you to keep going. Absolutely. Yeah, and the develop, the developer team is is very much interested in you know sustainable design. They've exhibited it in other projects um, around the country. So great. Go ahead, Casey. I, I just want to reinforce Phil's comment. I mean, you know, obviously we know that that uh, solar performance on each elevation is going to be different. Um, and we see in Chicago a uh, preponderance of buildings that you know are glass enclosed, and each facade is treated exactly the same. Um, obviously, the code looks at overall building performance, right, uh, of the envelope. But um, I, I do think that there is a higher and more sophisticated uh, approach that um, will one day catch up with the building codes, and um, you know, hopefully, we'll begin to see towers that aren't. Um, you know, so, uh, I don't know, so uniform in their treatment of the exterior cladding. Yeah, I, I think there's certainly merit here and it's something that we're already looking at is a study by facade of the glass and its properties and its qualities, understanding how much we're using in the direction that it's facing. All right. Um, are there any other comments from committee members, the applicant? If not, we will go ahead and proceed to the next item on the agenda. Whoever is presenting, can you stop sharing your screen? And then uh, the applicant team for 357 North Green, if you could start sharing your screen. Thank you. Okay. Thank you guys for your time. Yeah. All right, so we will now move to the second item on the agenda. Uh, 357 North Green Street, located in the 27th Ward, is a proposed 435 foot tall, 29 story commercial building comprising approximately 676,000 square feet of office space, 14,000 square feet of retail space, and 276 automobile parking spaces. Amenity space is proposed at the 15th floor with a terrace and commercial space at the 29th floor. The proposal will provide about half an acre of public open space at the ground level through the use of a paseo that will connect Halstead and Green Streets. The ground floor open space will consist of core 10 planters, terrace decking, and granite steps. To any committee members who are associated with this project, if you have not yet, please recuse yourself at this time and for the duration of the review for this project. To the applicant team, please clearly state your name and your relation to the project prior to speaking. You have 15 minutes to present your proposal. Committee members, please hold your comments and questions until after each presentation. Uh, please proceed with the presentation and again, state your name prior to speaking. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Paul Carroll from the development team and development group, also accompanied by Brian Bordeaux. Uh, we are the owner, developer, and general contractor for the project. Uh, we look forward to continue collaborating with all of you on the site, along with our consultant team, Taft, SCB, and Confluence. Now I'll pass it off to Scott Sire from SCB to begin the presentation. Thank you, Paul. And uh, thank you everybody for participating in this design review. As Paul mentioned, my name is Scott Sire. I'm a principal at SCB and I'll be presenting the project along with Matt Strange from Confluence when we regard the landscape portion. Uh, so, as uh, was mentioned before briefly, the program, uh, 357 North Green is a 30-story office building, approximately 690,000 square feet. It does contain a parking podium similar to the neighboring buildings at the base. 
And uh, what we kind of show with this particular image is just that it feels very much like a gateway looking down Green Street and it's starting along with the new building under construction at 360 North Green, feel like a gateway into this neighborhood. This map here shows the project's location at the northeast corner really of Fulton Market. And as we've noted there on the right-hand side, we will be following the West Loop design guidelines. Here we have our project, it's the yellow dot there. And there are some projects it's showing you the context, essentially. It's illustrating the relationship with new and existing developments within Fulton Market, because that's an important part of the scale of our uh, presentation. Here's the zoning map. Uh, it's where our site is located, and it's within the surrounding plan developments. So when it comes to the site itself, it's an empty site right now. There is no development on there. On the left-hand side, we have a view from, uh, view one is from Halstead, which is actually an elevated road. So you get a sense of the site from there, as well as view two is from the corner of Green and Kinsey. And you get a sense of those two areas, and you also get a very good feeling of the elevation of Halstead Street there. Along with that, on the right-hand side, you'll also get your first glimpse of the I-9094 expressway how that runs underneath the portion of our site. We'll get to that in a second. With respect to the context, we have three commercial properties immediately adjacent to our site, to the south and to the west. Those are three office buildings. They range in 300 to 440 feet. On the right-hand side, on the east, we have uh, two resi towers, uh, one existing and uh, 354 North Union was uh, just completed. So. We're looking at this with, with uh, kind of a, an idea of how we can have a similar scale and a similar height to these buildings. Apologies, it was a little delayed there. So here's an image that kind of has our site. We've got the survey underneath, really illustrating the accuracy of the, uh, the expressway underneath our site. But on the right-hand side, it's probably a bit more visible. Uh, the site is very prominent with great exposure to and from the expressway. Um, however, it's that, that same expressway that causes some unique challenges on our site. The expressway running underneath does not allow any building above it, any construction. So approximately 20% of our site is not buildable. With these constraints though, we start to explore the positioning of the building on the site. And of course, in, in it's uh, kind of its relationship to the context. And so we step back and scale. You see the red area there is the buildable area on our site. You get a larger view of our site, but also the relationship on the immediate context, as well as the urban fabric that we're looking at at this particular scale. What we started to do is position the building on the site. So we looked at two orientation options for our project. Uh, on the left, it's more of a traditional orientation. And on the right, we're calling it a responsive orientation, meaning a bit more responsive to the site. The traditional orientation on the left, it, it, it's, it's, it kind of is gonna create a bit of an alley effect along Green Street. It does constrain air and light as well as views. It restricts a public accessible space on Green Street. And it also restricts our floor plate size for a commercial project that we um, has a certain parameter that we're looking for. On the right-hand side, we have a responsive orientation. When we, when we place the building as a response to the site, we start to see increased air and light. We see an opportunity for outdoor space along Green Street. We can now achieve our desired floor plate size. In addition to all of that, we start to pick up a little bit of distance towards Halstead. So now we have a closer proximity to Halstead Street, which could allow for a future connection. And that's what we're gonna get into here as well. So this uh, slide here illustrates the distance from the neighboring buildings. And you see that it's really mostly impacted at that Southwest corner of our site. So we almost double the distance from the Southwest corner, expanding our air and light and avoid a canyon effect on these streets. But we also wanted to look at the rotation of this building, which is approximately 35 degrees and how it's uh, perhaps utilizing an energy optimization strategy. 
And so what we look at is uh, the, uh, we had uh, the orientation studied by a third party energy performance group. And as you can see on the left, the rotation reduces annual energy consumption. That's the box in blue there. This also is referenced in the 2022 Chicago Energy Code, where they mentioned that a rotation of this move is a positive note. Anything that can get the long access of the east and the west facades away from true east and west is beneficial from an energy consumption point of view. We looked at the solar study. We see here in green that we've looked at the planned landscape garden that's gonna be uh, to the south of the new building at 360 North Green, which is across the street from our site. And then of course, our small uh, plaza, which is almost an extension of that. So we, that's the area in green you see here. We looked at the solar studies and the impacts from that. We really focus then on the summer solstice. That's when you're gonna use this outdoor space the most. And this building, our building's orientation really fits well with these two outdoor spaces and has uh, almost no negative impact on the green space of this park. So with this orientation of the building, we move closer to Halstead Street and we begin to open up connection opportunities with that street through our site. And we can start to visualize in that green arrow, a pedestrian and bike path and a connection at the Halstead that encourages circulation from the elevated street at Halstead down towards Green Street through our site. And that's where we started to find some exciting opportunities at the base of this building. Hey Scott, just so wanted to let you know that you're, you're just over half of your presentation time. Thanks. Okay. So at the lower floors, we hold the corners of our site and we create street level activity where it's most important. That's the, those areas in red. The building straddles the site so that it can create plazas at Green Street as well as Halstead. So we're showing here is, uh, this is how we're representing the West Loop design guidelines. And so we can go through some of these points, but here's a view of the North. Essentially we're doing, we're taking a lot of the cues from the major design elements from the West Loop design guidelines, increasing the sidewalk, creating active uses. Some ones that we'll mention here is that we're mitigating the impacts on the street by aligning our tower with the expressway, number six. Number seven is also creating a placemaking opportunity for a public paseo and a public plaza from Halstead to Green Street. This is uh, the same topics that we're looking at from the South, where we still have, now, now you can really get a sense of that public entry plaza, number one there, that's going to be at the Southwest corner of our site. And we have so added these inset terraces throughout the tower. So we've created these outdoor terraces. We start to shape the building to um, make a, a nicer impact on the air and light within the ground plane. But then we also introduce these terraces throughout the building all in all, it's a commercial building that would respect the mass scale and architectural character of the adjacent buildings. So we thought it'd be interesting to kind of show how we got to this form. So we've extruded the form from the site. We've positioned our desirable tower floor plate on the site, holding the podium. We start to radial the two outside corners, the Northeast, the Southwest, responds to the, the site itself at the street activity. Um, we start to peel away the building, open up more air and light. And then all of those outdoor opportunities, whether they're the large terraces with views to the city or they're the individual terraces, we start to activate those as well. So this is about getting abundant outdoor access. Hey Scott, so you this have is a view five minutes of, left. Just as okay. Uh, this is a view of the aerial view looking towards downtown. You see our building of the scale and the context. This is an image here. You see how we're going to be utilizing all of these outdoor terraces. And so we, we really are looking for as much outdoor experience as possible. All in fact, um, we've created over 49,000 square feet of outdoor space. And the buildable area of our site is 47,000 square feet. So we've actually so surpassed what the buildable area is with increased outdoor out space, to be able to use it in the, within the building. And this is a view here that we have that's looking at the expressway along the city. You get the radial curve, it's very prominent. It's, a, it's kind of a gentle gesture towards the city. It's also giving a nice uh, view of downtown. So we want to create a nice little, um, uh, it's a very visible site. So we want to give some nice architectural elements to that. 
at the ground floor plane, we have a lobby, we have, excuse me, I'm gonna go back. So we have our lobby in the center with access to Green Street. We have our retail space. And you can see that all of our vehicular activity is off to the east with one curb cut on Kinsey Street. The second floor, we have this Paseo taking us to Halstead Street with abundant retail on both sides. Here's a diagram that illustrates that concept a little bit better. You see how you start to flow through the site. It's really um, all about kind of uh, a connection between Halstead and really this activated plaza that's on Green Street. And so with that transition into the Paseo, I'm gonna have uh, Matt Strange have spent a couple of minutes on his slides to discuss the landscape. Sure, thanks, Scott. Um, so what we're really trying to illustrate here is this idea that we have uh, this not only connection between the adjacent park up to Halstead, but also really this crescendo of the experience. In other words, we're not merely creating um, a connection to allow people to move up, but we're actually creating sort of a landing point and a destination that really, really capitalizes on that 25-foot uh, grade change that you see across the site with a series of, of terrace seating elements. Um, this slide here just illustrates some scale precedents. I think we can go through this in the interest of time. So we're really big believers that you know public spaces really need to have a diversity of different spatial and social experiences here. And, and so programmatically, we're trying to think of this place as a, a way to rise, a place to revel, and a place to rest. In other words, a place, a place where you can kind of eat, drink, and be merry, but also a place where you can lounge and relax and decompress in the green space. So the site plan focuses uh, here on a few key public areas, um, the streetscape along Green Street, as well as West Kinsey Street, um, that we've tried to be responsive to the adjacent development as much as possible to strengthen that corridor. Um, a plaza at the ground floor um, that then kind of ascends into a series of terraces through that Paseo space out to Halstead Street. Um, and we think, or as you can see from this diagram, we're using a lot of these arc and tangent forms that not not only begin to echo what's going on architecturally, but also pick up on some of the party from the adjacent park at 360 North Green. And then material palette wise, uh, we're trying to use uh, materials that really reflect the character of Fulton Market um, on some of that post-industrial character and picking up on the warmth and texture of the building. Thank you, Matt. And I will go by these images a bit quickly. We have about a minute and a half left. And so we're trying to show is this is closer up in scale shows a bit of the, uh, the transition between certain elements of the facade of the texture growing in scale, or I should say reducing in scale as you get closer down to the lower levels. It's a view on Green Street here. Here's the plaza. You start to see that we step back these terraces to create activation. When you're on the uh, Green Street um, sidewalk, the entry, the lobby is its own element, but the Paseo is also very engaging. It really is something that's a dramatic series of terraced uh, pase uh, opportunities, but it's also flanked with retail and interesting materiality and lighting. And on the other side, we'll call it the, uh, the west side is where we have our entry from uh, Halstead, drawing you in, abundant retail, pulling you so you see at the end there a view towards Fulton Market. The section illustrates uh, the, the program uses. You probably have seen that. The plans are quite efficient with the parking layout for the first uh, bottom floors, and then the typical office and uh, low rise and high rise. We have the elevations that do a very good job of explaining materiality, but they have a change in scale and so forth. But really what we talk about is the color of the materiality. So real quickly, we'll just try to get to material descriptions are really suited here where we talk about the, uh, the warmer material. It's immediate, we have a lot of texture in Fulton Market. And so we wanna create something that's unique with a warmer palette. Uh, these images here illustrate the three major components of the tower itself. So we have a podium with metal profiles at 30 inch spacing. Uh, that's getting a bit more of a, a smaller texture at the lower levels. The tower is a larger, a larger scale. It's every two floors. We have a metal profile with vertical and uh, a major vertical and minor profiles. And then the terraces on the right, obviously the same material as the tower, but we start to create a wing wall there. So the terraces themselves feel like they're carved in out of the mass. So with that said, thank you very much. Uh, we're happy to answer some questions, but our goal for this special site was really to create a unique site-specific vision quality exterior architecture, embrace the outdoor access opportunities, and create a building base that invites and enhances the pedestrian and the public experience. So thank you very much. All right, thank you, Scott.
Committee members, if there are any comments from the public in the Q&A box, please incorporate them however you see fit. Otherwise, the floor is now yours for comments and questions to the applicant team. Please raise your Zoom hand and we will call on you. Yes, Eleanor. What a great presentation. Thank you, Scott. And um, you have such a challenging site here. It is, it took quite a while just to kind of parse through the different levels, all the challenges that you have with the different utilities, everything else. Um, and then the way you've approached the, the site and the orientation of the building, I think is really inventive and um, very much embraces embraces the view from many folks that will be speeding by, you know, on the Kennedy. So um, just very impressed by all the different issues that you had to tackle. What I'd like to focus on, and I know my fellow committee members each have their, their own um, particular interests on this site, but for the site plan itself, um, you know, I've done some work in the West Loop and there's always been a challenge of incorporating public open space in this area and real green space. And especially in this section that is north of the um, previously built out Fulton Market or the historic Fulton Market, more of this Kinsey PMD area um, because it was so heavily industrialized with all the transit. So, and thanks Josh for pulling this up. So right next to the Metro tracks here, um, this was an area that was ripe to look at a linear park. And I think you see the start of that across the street and continuing into your site with which you guys have embraced with the patio. Um, I would encourage you to kind of re-examine how your site connects in that linear park. And is there a way to even make that more robust in your site um, again, I know you're challenged by the grade changes and um, the Paseo and how all of that works through your site, and I recognize that. But I think that this could be a missed opportunity where this really becomes a punctuation point. Your building is so strong, make the landscape as strong as a continuation of that park. So I would really encourage you to re-examine that. Um, and the rest of the circulation, I know my other um, members of the team will address that too, but I think that you truly have some challenges and I don't have some strong suggestions on how to solve it. So I'm gonna turn it over to <laughs> my other committee members, but thank you for the presentation. Thank you very much. Did the, um, Matthew, did you wanna comment on that or? Sure. Uh, thank you for your, your comments on that. I, I think we were trying to, as I mentioned, connect to the adjacent <laughs> park um, and, and as you mentioned, also have some challenges with the grading. The retail didn't necessarily get the chance to go through too much. The retail along the metro there is up at elevation four and a half. And so we were trying to make sure we had an accessible connection up to that um, slightly elevated retail space. So we were um, providing that through there. We also have an elevator that goes from the ground floor up to that Paseo level at plus 20. And so, you know, the, the challenge here was to make sure that we had enough outdoor seating space that could really support the retail through that Paseo, um, especially, you know, since it's going to have some somewhat limited visibility uh, unless you're kind of standing and walking through there. So we wanted to make sure it sort of spilled out towards the street to make that as clear as possible. Uh, but we could certainly look at opportunities to enhance the green there or, or make a clearer, um, I guess, green band along the Metra as a continuation of that adjacent park. I, I The one comment I would give to that is I even question how healthy this retail will be in those locations. So I guess that's what I'm suggesting is you may want to pull back even a little bit more and really examine, does it make sense to have struggling retail or are you better off turning that over to green space where it really can bring more folks into your site? So, you know, that's for both of you, I guess, to think about both of your sets of your team. Sure, thanks. Yes, thank you. Leslie? Thank you. Thank you uh, 
for the presentation. Um, this is a, a really exciting project and I appreciate um, the, the care that you've taken to actually look at the orientation and, you know, sort of roll with the, um, uh, you know, with the punches when it comes to the site constraints with the expressway um, and care that you've taken to look at energy efficiency measures with the orientation of the building. I think that that was, that was really great. And I appreciate your efforts on that. Um, this is a, it, it's a funny place in Chicago because Chicago has like zero topography, but then you get to a place like this where Halstead is plus 25 mm -hmm. above green. And you know, Scott, when you gave the presentation, you talked about this being a gateway site. And so like the pressure is on to create this really cool place that, you know, brings together all of these unique, both challenges and opportunities um, within the city. And Halstead Street, when it is elevated, there are a number of other, as you know, multifamily buildings that don't really have great um, entries. They're car centric. Um, finding the pedestrian entry is a little bit difficult. And for someone on a bike or a pedestrian, this environment is not super friendly when you're when you're going down Halstead. So with this Paseo and connecting Halstead and Green, I think this is a fantastic idea. It's one of the only places along this Halstead corridor when it's elevated that you can get to a lower level. And there in Fulton Market, you know, this is a unique um opportunity and experience to get to stuff below you instead of just kind of looking. It's like the lower upper Michigan situation also, like where's the stairs? How do I get there? So what I went and, and I, I love that you've you've attempted to do that with the Paseo and also that you have um, started to look at the accessibility with through this this elevator bank. What I would encourage is that you really push this and and, sep and um, celebrate what this gateway means from the Halstead Street facade. So right now there is this kind of triangular piece that brings you into, into the Paseo. However, um, it would there was a unique opportunity here to maybe carve a little bit out of that car court and really create an, in, a really prominent um, highly visible uh, way to get into that Paseo, that stairwell, that, you know, that really beautiful staircase. Um, and the entry to that could even, you know, be at a right angle to the building as opposed to a right angle to the Halstead Street uh, alignment. So that's sort mm -hmm. of my first comment is really punch up this idea of gateway from Halstead Street. Um, my second comment is around accessibility and Eleanor mentioned, you know, the, the retail component um, and how there's, you know, there's some question not only about how you access it, but the necessity of having retail at this location that is a little bit difficult to get to and not super visible. So um, really understanding the elevator banks and what that, if you are taking an elevator and these are public elevators, how you're going to access all layers of uh, the, all of these different elevations of activity and experience. The patio at zero, the, the retail that happens at two different levels along this, um, uh, along the Paseo. Um, and then what is that experience entering and leaving that elevator bank? Um, if any of you have been to the Grant Park garage, uh, it, you know, when you come up from the garage and you go through those doors, it's a little bit weird, even though it's public, it's not, doesn't feel super safe and welcoming. Like you've arrived at this, you know, one of Chicago's greatest amenities. And this narrow hallway coming from the elevator bank is giving Grant Park vibes. So if, just taking another look at that and making sure that either the stops on the elevator get you to where you need to be, or that this is a really intentional, easy space for the public to, you know, to access this and experience it in the, in the celebration, you know, the celebratory way that you planned it. Um, and lastly, you know, just emphasizing a point Eleanor made, like really looking at that linear park. I mean, is this sort of the beginning of the linear park? Is it a standalone space? Is it, you know, how does this kind of add to park space in the West Loop? Because there's so little of it. Um, this mm. is this is a really critical amenity. And so, you know, taking advantage of 
the, the decisions that you've already made around, we're going to create this really cool public space and it's gonna be green and it's gonna be a park and it's gonna be for the public and making sure that that is you know, consistent with your vision of how you're treating the entirety of the site and adding to the amenity in the context. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, we, I mean, to, to both your points, uh, uh, Leslie and Eleanor, I mean, there were a lot of constraints on this site. And so we found ourselves dealing with those immediate constraints quite a bit and how can we find something? And then we had, and I don't wanna call it a eureka moment, but we certainly had a moment where we thought, what if this could be a connection and what could we do this? And now we're at that point of, okay, if we all embrace this concept, let's really make it something special. And that's what we wanna do, but we also wanna make sure that everybody is on board with what this could be. But we started to fall into place and we really, got excited about what that connection can be. Now we got to make it something that was really going to be a major draw. And as you pointed out, no failing retail, it's got to be something that is always going to be activated in a positive way. Thank you. No. Yeah, I'll just um, reiterate uh, both what Leslie and Eleanor mentioned. I, I think it's a great project and I, I commend you for not only a very clear presentation, but taking the constraints of the site and really turning them into a very interesting project. I think the angled tower really works with the massing of the surrounding blocks. And the interest is the Paseo. Uh, and also the change in elevation of that Paseo. And uh, Scott, I think your comment of how do we make this really an exceptional space, I think is what everybody is talking about. I, I wondered if this is an opportunity, I, I like the comments to strengthen the landscape. Yes, I agree with that. But a lot of that Paseo is under the footprint of the building. Mm -hmm. And I just wonder if your design team of landscape and architect should also include artists, that this Paseo is a beautiful opportunity for an artist to put their thumbprint on the ceiling, on the flooring, on the color and texture of that space. And if you just looked at like, the Saul LeWitt contributions to Lever House or Mass Mocha, or if you gave this space to a Jaume Plenza, uh, what could your design team do in collaboration with an artist around the Paseo? Mm -hmm. And that could sort of ramp it up to a really exceptional space in Chicago and a gateway space. I agree, it, it absolutely is a gateway, gateway space from Halstead and the beginning of this whole uh, pedestrian flow. So I would just encourage you to keep going with this idea, but consider mm -hmm. seriously the engagement uh, of an art component that, that pairs with the design team. Yeah, we're certainly not ready to hit um, the CD button just yet, but uh, you know, we we wanted to, as I mentioned, have confidence that we're we're making the right move with everybody uh, who does have a say in this, and and be respectful of the process as well. But we felt pretty strongly that there's something here. We may not be there completely, but we're headed in the right direction. So we start to get into the space, but then how does the materiality? Maybe we can get more green space. How can we make this start to work? And that's where we're starting to really get pretty deeply into. And I appreciated your comments too about the fact that most of this Paseo is under um, a canopy. While of course we'd like to have as much green as possible through there, it's, it's just not realistic everywhere. Um, we can, we've been talking about incorporating things like, you know, movable seasonal containers, things that can be changed out and there to add some green and personality, but really do like the idea of incorporating, you know, whether it's art or light or some kind of element that really creates an exciting gateway experience from Halstead down to green. But I think I was saying something a little different. I, if you look at your renderings of the Paseo, uh, the rather flat wood ceiling to me yeah. with down lights uh, that kind of wraps up and turns up on the west side. Uh, 
to me, it's, it's an opportunity for something more. I, I, I think that uh, if you gave that to an artist, it could be a really compelling component, for example. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. No, thank you very much. Casey? I uh, really am mostly just going to echo the comments of my colleagues. I want to thank the team for doing a, a you know, very strong analysis and uh, design for the project. There's clearly been a lot of work put in it to date. Um, I think it's notable that we haven't actually commented much on the building. We're all focused on the public space. And uh, that's, I think, to your credit in terms of um, actually delivering on the gateway promise. The, the one thing that I did want to know is you've set up a, you know, on a very complicated site, you've chosen to make your uh, task even more complicated by terminating or initiating that linear park. And so I would just encourage you to look at other examples of linear parks for ideas about how you might um, terminate or initiate, however you want to look at it, um, the experience of that park from, from up on Halstead and, and see it, as Eleanor pointed out in her remarks, um, uh, see it as a progression, right, all the way through. Um, and I think that uh, Phil's recommendation, very good recommendation that art may be a way in which you can unlock that um, is something that I would encourage you all to consider. Very good, thanks. thanks. Yeah, we 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 all have the same goals here. That we're we're feeling strong about this concept of the continuity and the very. I mean, I would say there's two other there's two other projects in Fold Market that do this pass through, but I don't know of any that do it at these levels like this. And so we're really trying to create something that draws you in, particularly at a location where it is a gateway. Now we really got to focus on the materiality, make sure we have enough green space, make sure we've designed it appropriately for the rest of the context. And so um, there's still work to be done, I would say, but we we wanted to, um, we were hoping that everybody would agree that this is a, a strong um, idea that is worth uh, continuing to follow through. All right, thank you. Uh, do any other committee members have any comments on this project? All right, so it doesn't look so. Um, all right, so thank you, uh, 357 North Green applicant team. Um, we'll thank move on to the for all your comments. We'll move on to the third item on the agenda. So um, the folks with 400 North Morgan, if you want to start sharing your presentation, I'll go ahead and just do the quick overview. Uh, the project, which spans across 400 North Morgan, 370 North Morgan, and 401 North Morgan, is a proposed multi-phase mixed use development with three sub areas. Sub area A, 400 North Morgan, is proposed to include a 450 foot tall building containing 478 residential units and approximately 7,000 square feet of retail. Sub-area B, located at 401 North Morgan, is proposed to include a building that will either contain 548 residential units or office space and will be subject to future site plan approval. Sub-area C, located at 370 North Morgan, is proposed to include a 360-foot tall building containing 529 residential units and approximately 10,000 square feet of retail space. The proposed project is located in the West Town community area along with the uh, lo along with being located in the Kinsey Industrial Corridor and within the Kinsey Industrial Corridor conversion area. To any committee members who are associated with this project, if you have not yet, please recuse yourself at this time and for the duration of the review for this project. To the applicant team, please clearly state your name and your relation to the project prior to speaking. You have 15 minutes to present your proposal. Committee members, please hold your comments and questions until after each presentation. Uh, all right, please proceed with your presentation. Again, please state your name prior to speaking. Thank you. Thanks, Josh. For the record, Katie Jinky Dale from DLA Piper. I'm the zoning counsel for this project. Um, joined on the call today by representative, representatives from New York based Vista Property Group, which is the applicant developer for this matter, as well as representatives from Gensler, the design team. 
Given the limited time, I will quickly turn this over to Michael Townsend from Gensler, who will run through the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. My name is Michael Townsend. I'm the design director here at Gensler, and I'm joined by Jim uh, Prendergast as well. The development at the parcels 370, 400, and 401 North Morgan aimed to be a part of what is an evolution of this part of the Kinsey Industrial Corridor. And this is the area we affectionately refer to as the between the tracks. In the studying of these three parcels as a whole, we noticed immediately there is an opportunity um, inherent in studying a multi-parcel project um, and our ability to transform uh, this larger place as a mixed use area and transform the streetscapes. Um, so we wanted to prioritize streetscapes, provide much needed green space to this neighborhood and also thread into the existing character. As with each of these prior proposals that we just discussed, uh, we are referencing the following three guidelines um, while conceptualizing this proposal. Morgan Street is a significant north-south thoroughfare in Fulton Market, and um, most all of the aforementioned guidelines call out this street as a priority for improvement in both function and beautification. And our site serves as a critical piece connecting the transformation of the historic Fulton Market District uh, with other pieces of this puzzle, such as the proposed Hubbard Street improvements and additional transit options to the north. Note on this slide that there is a significant lack of public green space as we've been talking about for the last few hours. Currently, the sites are spread across a mix of um, uses and tapestry of zoning and land use. And while the area has been historically industrial in nature, a broad mix of uses um, it can be found there today in this corridor. On the three sites today, there is a series of low scale buildings of varying character and quality. And of note, 413 North, Car North Carpenter on the left is a character building and will be incorporated into the new tower. And on the 401 site to the right is an array of interconnected structures stepping up that hill on Kinsey. Most noticeably, the well known and well loved Morgan Manufacturing venue. Just some few brief photos to, to show the flavor in the current state of Oregon Street in this stretch between the tracks um, and the relatively undefined street paths and a lack of intentional landscaping or bike lanes. And one of the challenges with Kinsey is its orientation as a one-way street, which we'll talk about, and the relatively narrow existing right-of-way between buildings here. Carpenter is a less traveled and more utilitarian street um, and a roadway save the character building in the upper right hand image. Finally, at the top of the hill um, east on Kinsey, um, we have Sangamon and we have an array of architectural styles on the 401 site and some of these existing structures um, you can see here on the bottom two images. Our proposal is to develop both the 400 and 370 North Morgan um, as largely residential uses, um, complemented with active frontages and open spaces at the ground level. 401 North Morgan, as mentioned, um, would follow in the character of these first two phases, but also um, be uh, seeking later site plan approval. So to the best that we could, we sought to give each parcel the best access to natural light and favorable winds, especially at the amenity levels. And most importantly, the buildings are staggered and set back to give uh, a quality of daylight to the open space um, that's located at the intersection of Kinsey and Morton. The parcels, of course, do not live in isolation. And as such, we, we have the opportunity to connect north and south with new active streetscapes and also extend a network of green space interventions planned at some of our neighboring edges. Sitting in context, these three buildings will sit in concert with this continued evolution in the neighborhood height table. At less than 500 feet each, the projects will sit within precedent of many of these new and recently approved projects, while this diagram is out of date as of a couple of hours ago. <laughs> The massing of the tower sought to contribute to three things, setting back and providing meaningful open space at the street level, uh, responding to the neighborhood context and history with scaled podium expressions, and also 
stepping and shifting in height and in plan to visually help break down the size and minimize the tower overlaps. In our conversations with DPD over the past year, a number of adjustments have been made um, to better meet those goals. And significantly uh, from the north here, uh, the orientation and profiles of the 400 and 401 sites were adjusted to help minimize that perceived wall to the north neighborhood. Additionally, small setbacks were employed along those raised tracks to help further accentuate that stepping at the northern edge. Concerning the solar study, which we'll show here, the neighborhood to the north um, of the sites is a single block deep before it hits the expressway and is currently comprised of an array of uses and vacant lots. Throughout the year, the relatively the relative narrowness of the towers um, is helping with that and that there's a temporality to much of the shadow and the stepping of the height is also incrementally helping us reduce the length of those shadows. So in, in context, again, this is the aerial perspective showing for the first time the phase one proposal um, amidst the other proposed and under construction projects. The site plan of the three parcels begins to show the new open spaces at both 400 and 401, and these two combine to form a generous volume of open space. We think the scale and the proportion of these open spaces is um, really great for a wide variety of uses. We're excited that we're able to offer uh, a nearly a very large and nearly square public open space on the 401 site, and the residential lobbies are oriented to Morgan Street. Uh, along with commercial retail spaces, helping activate those edges. New protected bike lanes will set a new precedent for the multimodal modal Morgan Street. And we've um, tried to limit our access with curb cuts um, to either existing locations or relegated to mid-block locations. One of the critical exercises that we went through with DPD was just understanding the right of way on Kinsey. As you can see, we inherited a 30 foot, six, 30 foot six inch uh, gap between parcel lines on Kinsey and have um, set back now to have an over 70 foot right of way at Kinsey at the lower lowest um, point and over 90 feet up above. This diagram also shows that additional setback in the towers uh, facing north on the right side of that additional 67 feet. The program of the two parcels is similar with a podium of retail and parking and multiple amenity levels up the tower. And the material concept is twofold, a masonry podium that's sympathetic to the context, that's rich in texture, it has a lot of warmth. Um, and as of a human scale, and then above the towers begin to evolve what is a fairly common gridded language of Fulton Market. We felt we had the opportunity to evolve that language uh, for a new location. So you'll see a much more elongated uh, vertical proportion to the grid, as well as a much lighter tone uh, to the metal in the towers to help contrast the dark meadows in the neighborhood. And to help tie those two things together, we're using a common warm toned bronze metal that's found both in the podium and the tower um, as an accent and infill. Hi, you have about seven minutes left. Seven Thanks. minutes, okay. An example of the evolution of the form through the process with DPD was the, the right sizing and the scaling of that podium and the iterative nature of designing that um, podium facade. Along Kinsey, the evolution of the massing has allowed us to increase setbacks and also narrow, narrow the visual profiles of the two towers. And then we have a few examples here of some of the before and after of the existing condition and juxtaposed against the new proposal. So this is the mid-block entry to the 400 North Morgan residential. It's gracious, welcoming. And then again, a before and after of the Kinsey right away. Looking north or south from the North neighborhood, 400 North Morgan, which is to the right, um, you can see another a piece of this puzzle that we employed in the facade treatment and taking that and stripping away that gridded texture from the uppermost volume in this location to help differentiate and provide hierarchy with the facades, helping that upper volume to recede more into the sky. As noted, the podium expressions across the two parcels are really varied and layered um, relative to the context and each one offers different streetscapes and residential lobbies with retail opening to the street along Morgan. 
We've seen this image before, but I think this reiterates the attempt to broaden the Kinsey right away to be much more in line with the Chicago standard. From the east, the two towers vary in scale and in setback, and the grid is um, common across Kinsey, but then starts to deviate as you move away with the grid in the far right changing in scale and density. And then coming down Kinsey, we get another perspective of the scale of the podiums and their relationship to the setback of the towers above. Finally, we turn a little bit north, um, looking north on Morgan and start to see the open spaces speaking to each other across Morgan, Morgan with the large open space to the right, the park at 401, and the open space to the left at 400 North Morgan. So I'll run very quickly through the plan stack here. This is 400 North Morgan, which I've already talked mostly about the ground plane here. Um, the character building to the far left where we're retaining uh, most all of the facade on both the west and the south sides. There has, are a few levels of parking in the, above the lobby level that serve the residences. Unique to this parcel in, within that podium expression, we felt like it was interesting to offer a unique unit style. So these are duplex, uh, double height, almost loft-like units within the podium right above parking. And then the primary amenity level sits just above that at that transition between podium and tower. Typical residential level has 16 units and has that stagger and plan. And then a special amenity level sits at level 29 with a few levels of residents sitting above that. The elevations are elongated and with expressive grids in the tower um, with a subtle integration of that bronze metal we felt like the introduction of that bronze metal into the grid itself helps us also reduce the window wall ratio subtly. So there's some contrast where the, the bronze metal and the glass sit in concert together, but help us reduce that ratio. At 370, the lobby is on the prominent corner facing those two parkscapes um, across the intersection, with two levels of parking sitting in the podium above. And at level four, we have an expansive common outdoor amenity space that faces east. A typical residential level comprises of 18 units. And then similarly, an upper amenity terrace takes advantage of the height and those eastern views. Again. Finally, a few small levels cap the top. In elevation, the stripped down uh, facade typology now is used to announce the top third of the tower to the south neighborhood almost as a jewel box. And that drama of that volume is accentuated by sticking out and cantilevering slightly from the facades below. And this incrementally helps us with sight lines uh, to the east and west along the tracks. Michael, you have about two minutes left. That's great. I have two slides, so I won't take two minutes. Uh, <laughs> Finally, um, 401 North Morgan, given that it is part of a later site plan approval, we've developed uh, initial design guidelines, which follow much of the characteristics of the things we just talked about on those first two buildings. Um, and then additionally, we'll be targeting lead silver and are eyeing things such as uh, extensive uh, work within the landscaping, natural landscaping, um, tree planting, working landscape, as well as waste diversion and EV charging initially as some of the ways that will meet the criteria for sustainability. So with that, in summary, we're thankful for this opportunity to that um, we've been given here and are happy to talk to you about it. Um, this is the in-progress look at these plans for these really important parcels in the Kinsey Industrial Corridor. So thank you. All right, thank you so much. Committee members, if there are any comments from the public in the Q&A box, again, please incorporate them however you see fit. Otherwise, the floor is now yours for comments and questions to the applicant team. Please raise your Zoom hand and we will call on you. Thanks, Leslie. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, this is a big challenge, three sites. Um, and I think that, you know, your approach to this and uh, site planning efforts, you know, are to be commended. I, I guess I have one uh, question and one comment. One is on um, the streets surrounding the two parcels or the two sites that you showed us. 
um, when you talked about pedestrian and vehicular circulation, it looked like um, there were quite a few curb cuts. Um, you mentioned that there were some existing in some mid block. Um, I, I just wondered about the efficiency of having separation of parking, uh, separation of um, curb cuts for parking and loading, and if there was any economy um, on Morgan um, and on uh, Carpenter, I think there's also difference between, there's two different curb cuts, one for parking, one for loading. If you looked at trying to find economies so that you reduce the number of curb cuts, um, thereby enhancing um, the pedestrian uh, experience and safety. Yeah, that's a great observation. We're, we've been talking actually a lot with DPD over the last months specifically about this and with CDOT. Um, some of the challenges as with, that are common across these are that we're a little bit landlocked between the rails. Um, we also have these interesting tunnels underneath the rail line to the north that we're not actually allowed to use um, and can't rely on, although they're used today for many loading purposes, so these two. So we're not actually allowed to, to take advantage of those. Um, that said, I think we have, so one of the things we've done recently is we've removed a curb cut off of Kinsey on the 401 site. Um, we are just utilizing an existing loading path that's on Carpenter adjacent to the character building and, and not changing that. So we're, we're, we're trying to, we're talking a lot about these three um, curb cuts here on the northern far, part of Morgan. And if there's a way, um, I think we only have one on the, the, the 400 site, which is adjacent to the lobby, which I think really work, works well for parking, but the two um, next to each other on the 401 site or something we'll need to look much more closely at. Part of the back and forth we've had is that we're trying to retain um, the vast majority of the existing Morgan Manufacturing Building, which you can see the right half, entire half of that parcel is all existing, and we're trying to retain those buildings. Um, as part of this development. And so we just have very limited location, basically access points to serve that new structure. So that's one of the challenges, just in terms of just pure space and whether or not we'd actually be able to combine those two, but it is something we will be looking at in the future. Uh, addition, right. Additionally, this is, just, just, this is Jim Prudent, I guess, from Gensler. Additionally, we're actually reshuffling some of the existing curb cuts on sites and pulling them closer together. Right. So some of the, while well, you're seeing curb cuts uh, on different portions of the site, Many of them are relocated um, from previous uh, curb cut locations um, so that we're trying to minimize new curb cuts by re reshuffling the ones that are already on the site. Right. Yeah, right now the existing condition is there's a curb cut on both sides of Morgan, basically right in the middle of our green spaces. So we're trying to, at a minimum, move them and at a maximum trying to reduce those. Um, and I think just to finalize on that point, we'd also be looking at whether or not we can combine curb cut on Carpenter as well for this location uh, for the same reasons. Yeah, thank you for that explanation. I, I would even question, question using the existing curb cuts and if they're serving your project in a way that is that, you know, if they're serving your project or if you can do away with them also combining some of the curb cuts. Um, there's just a lot. And so if, you know, if doing that analysis to make sure that they're serving your project well, they're satisfying the functions that need to be accommodated, but then you're also prioritizing the pedestrian environment, I think it, it would be well worth the effort. Um, my, my comment is um, on the two buildings, on one of the, the looking west on Kinsey elevation, I think it's interesting that you know, there's some intentionality around differentiating the bases of the two buildings. Um, similar materials, but different architectural expression. Um, I really love the, the residential units over the parking. I think that was a really smart move. Um, that building looks like it's been, like it's spent, you've spent more time designing it than um, the one on the other side of Kinsey, the, the detailing, the architectural features, the brickwork, um, it looks like a very high quality building. And the, the building um, to the left of it, 370, um, while the functions in the base may be slightly different, um, I'm noticing that you know the architectural expression is different and that's okay. 
Um, I think it's okay if the buildings don't look the same at the base, if that's your intent and that's an expression of the kind of materiality and program that you have inside those buildings. The trouble I have is, is when you move up to the tower and the towers look identical. Um, they're very, very similar in massing, in material, in fenestration. And since you've taken, you know, and since you've been intentional around differentiating the base, I think it would be nice to also differentiate the towers in the same way and develop an architectural vocabulary that did allow for some variation, even if you use similar materials, but you use them in a way that allowed for a little bit of differentiation as opposed to twin buildings, which is what the expression looks like now. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you, Leslie. That's a great comment. All right, Eleanor, do you want to go next? Yeah, um, hi guys, thank you so much for the presentation. This is um, a huge project. It's really going to change kind of the look and feel of that neighborhood. It's nice to see the residential coming in here. Um, you know, I do want to comment on the site plan, but before we leave the slide, I'm looking at the setback um, to the right, the five foot, I believe it is. Um, I don't, that doesn't quite scale out to me. And I'm wondering, I know there is a setback requirement for towers as part of the West Loop guidelines. So just an FYI to the team to maybe check that and, and see what that dimension really is. Um, but in any case, if we could go to the site plan, if uh, Josh or whoever's controlling the- We can move that. Screen, yeah. Um, okay, so what I was curious about, and I feel like it's been a great tie-in for all the projects we've looked at today, I'm, I feel like a broken record a little bit, you know, the green space in this part of the Kinsey Industrial Corridor has really been a challenge, as I'm sure you have heard from the residents here, and one thought to address it was to create a linear park as projects began, develop, be, began to be developed along the metro tracks. And where that happens in your site is at the bottom left, whatever um, this number is, I'm not sure which um, building this is, um, but just south of Kinsey. And it would be the par part of your site that backs up to the tracks to then connect through to what is happening to the east. Yes, thank you very much. Um, because that was required for the sites that are directly east of you. You may have heard that we've just reviewed the further project that's even further east. Um, it would be a nice continuation for consideration for your site to also continue that green space. I understand that Metra has the land that is directly south of you. But you could also consider moving some of the green space that you have elsewhere on your parcel to the south side. I think that it could be a nice linear park, dog walking space, you know, for the neighborhood as an amenity, as opposed to what we're seeing now that are kind of disparate green spaces that objectively you could see those being kind of privatized because they are really linked to those particular buildings. Um, so I put that out there for consideration. Yeah, thanks, thanks Eleanor. I think that's something we'll definitely be studying um, and that would obviously be some combination of uh, working with the Metroland and on our parcel as well and seeing what that looks like together so that it's not isolated to one side or the other. Bill. Yeah, I'll just um, first, uh, I agree completely with Eleanor. I think that uh, if we could advocate for that linear park, we should find every way to, to do that. And if it means adjusting some of the open space on Kinsey, I think it would be worth the trade-off to have the continuity of that Metro park. Uh, so I agree with that completely. And I also agree with uh, Leslie on the elevation of the two buildings on Morgan. If you could go back to that yeah. Morgan Street elevation. Uh, I do think the, um, the base of the North Tower seems 
very successful. I agree, I like very much the residential units, the townhouse units being integrated in the base. That's something we haven't seen before. Uh, and the fact that the two bases are different uh, seems great. And I also wondered why the two towers are the same. So I would encourage you to develop more diversity between the two uh, buildings because I, I don't think it's your intent that the two uh, look the same. Uh, it's not like Commonwealth Plaza, for example. Uh, you, you really are trying to define uh, a different identity to both projects. And I think that uh, the more the towers could reflect that, the better. Uh, and just getting back to the energy aspirations, I think silver is kind of a low bar. I would encourage in 2023 to be able to get to higher energy efficiency levels. And uh, we mention this all the time as a committee on design to encourage design teams to really get innovative with energy efficiency. So I would encourage you to do that. Thank you, Phil. Yeah, uh, again, really good comments and things that we definitely need to study and will study. Um, I think too that just because it's come up twice now with the similarity of the two towers, I think that's something we'll we want to look at closely because, um, again, I think I think we all feel like they should be um, an evolution of each other and not identical, like you said. So. Um, we have to find what is common amongst them and what uh, varies so that they have their own design language. Yeah. We've talked about the massing of the towers. Uh, I just, I think that's become very successful, this idea of the vertical emphasis, the the breaking the tower into these two components. Uh, I think has been very successful. So I think just further facade refinement uh, would really improve the project. Okay, Josh, any, any other comments? Um, I'll Post to the committee. Any other comments, committee members? If not, uh, then I think we'll go ahead and call it. Uh, so before we adjourn on behalf of DPD, thank you again for all of your critical thinking and thoughtful comments on these three important projects. Um, the meeting will now come to a close. So thank you all for attending and sharing your thoughts, and we hope you'll come back soon. Thanks. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.